Amen. That's all. You are charged up today. That's this year in the Korodobi. Your people. <laughs> I saw I saw what you did. I, I saw what you did. All right then. I say flow. <laughs> it's hundred naira <now>, give. <laughs> it's hundred naira. <now>, yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Um, all right, for the while you are seated, for the fourth time or fifth time, <laughs> huh? For the fourth time, look to somebody left and to the right and say, "Happy birthday!" <laughs> happy birthday! Happy birthday! Amen. Amen. All right. Um, this morning, it gladdens my heart, our first speaker for all right. Um, and I'm happy because I've said it that we Nigerians we are very um, how do we describe ourselves in a polite way. All right. So when we say West Africa, even if we say Africa Convention, we call ourselves and that is Africa. All right. <laughs> and we'll be happy with ourselves. Okay. But we have a speaker for the first time from East Africa. All right. And, amen. And let me just say, I'm not, let me know, I've, I've shared this in the church, but some people, I mean, the people online that have a head. Um, how did I get to invite him? I met him for the first time in the green room just about 10 minutes ago. That's the first time I'm seeing him physically in my life. All right? And people should understand this also about ministry. If you greet somebody 100 times, doesn't change anything in terms of inclination. Um, what happened was, I, th- I think about four, some years ago, maybe three years ago, I was going through TBN, and I saw somebody preach, and I saw the people, huh? and I listened for a while, and I just went on with it, but it registered in my mind. So I think about two months ago, um, somebody sent me on a WhatsApp chat, and she's here. Uh, She had been with me um, um, from our campus fellowship in the University of Lagos. This is since 1990. So this is 32 years, right? Okay. And she had never done this before. And she knows me very well. She will not try to influence me on anything. I mean, she knows me that well. So she just sent a WhatsApp chat to me on um, YouTube a video. So I, I didn't look at it for about 48 hours. Then I clicked on it. And I just listened for 45 seconds. 45. And I heard some things. And I just switched it off. And I said, there's this minister I met who came for pastor house meeting in Kenya and he gave me his number I said if I call this man he should be able to tell me how I will reach him in Uganda so I called him he said give me 10 minutes I will get somebody for you who knows him the person called the person I called the person I sent the message the person spoke to me properly yeah good morning how are you uh, all right and dropped the phone said okay I will try to help you so dropped the phone then called me back he said ah it's you. I'm so sorry. I watch you on um, YouTube. I know you. Ah, when they told me somebody, I didn't know it was you. I listened and all of that. I said, don't worry. I'll, I'll get him. I'll reach him and all of that. Finally, I, he gave me his number and I called him. And he said, I said, look, I think um, 
it's time for you to come to Nigeria from what I heard. And he said, God spoke to him that the door to Nigeria will be open to you. He said, oh, this was actually, he said, sit down. The phone call will come. And when the phone call comes, know that that is the person that you are to go with. So he left it and the phone call came. And let me tell you what I heard. And I've been listening to, I grew up under word of faith and all of that. And there are people that preach from what they read in books. There are people that preach haven't integrated that word. And when they integrate the word and digest the word and they are saying it, they will say what you know in a way you are hearing for the first time in your life. There will be something original. There will be something authentic. You know it. You know what they're saying. I mean, it's the message. All right. But they will say it in a fresh. You know that this is what is called the processed word. So there are people that tell us, oh, we're part of word of faith, but uh, because of this, this, this. Well, that's what they said. There are people that practiced the word of faith. There are two different things. A lot of people try to give credence to what they are doing now, which is outside a strong word base by saying that, oh, I've been that, I was with that, I was with that. But that you were with that doesn't mean you understood it when you were there. All right. There's a difference between a person just participates in something and when a person actually understands and has practiced uh, uh, something there. And and that's what I heard him say, heard from him, that I knew that um, this man understands um, um, and he will fit in perfectly with Wafbeck. His name is Apostle, no, I've not even mentioned his name. His name is Apostle Grace Lobega. And he's right here with his lovely wife also who came along with him. He is senior apostle at Fanero Ministries and the vision bearer of the church. Now, you have about 20 Ugandans here. Can you, can you rise to your feet? You have about 20, don't worry, all of you are. are you all coming from Uganda. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Amen. He is the highest streamed pastor in Uganda, uh, with his sermon reaching uh, uh, over 200,000 people a month, with a congregation um, throughout the world. The minister that finally introduced me to him told me, right, because he also came up under, he grew up under a minister who grew up under uh, Bishop Benson Idahosa. And he told me that we have never seen anything like this in Uganda. Rain, sunshine, stadiums are full. That it will be raining, the stadiums are packed. He said in the history of Uganda, we have never seen this kind of thing at work. Let's rise our feet and for the first time, welcome Apostle Grace Lebega. You may take your seats. Happy West Back. <laughs> Greetings from Uganda. Many more wanted to come, but the time would not allow. And I'm sure they will be streaming with us. We've been praying for this day since the day we had. And like the man of God told you, the Lord had spoken to me that I was to come here, I was wondering how, and um, by God's grace, when he contacted me, the the response was so easy, (laughs) and um, 
thank God for him. I took time to study him as a man too, watched a few, because when they told me about him, uh, interestingly, it was also the first time I'd heard about him. But when I, I, I watched him, listened, uh, he reminded me of something that we used to do a couple of years ago somewhere in New Jersey. I don't, I don't know whether you remember, you knew of a man called David Demola. He used to have a very wonderful minister's believers conference. He reminded me of these days. Great things. Uh, man of God, I'm honored to be here and your beloved wife. Um, all the people that have come from wherever you, you've come from to listen to what God is telling us this season. I asked him, what do you want me to share? He told me, anything God tells you. So when a man of God gives you such liberty, it's one, it shows that he trusts your spirit and the God that is at work in your life. But two, also, that he's not intimidated by greatness. Come on, let's thank God. That's a true mark of fatherhood. Thank you for fathering our generation. Praise the Lord. Because of time, allow me to go straight into the world. No preambles, no introductions, nothing. Straight into the world because of time. Somebody shout amen. amen. Today I want to talk about the power of positioning. For those of you who, write, who love writing notes. The power of positioning. The power of positioning. Paul says in Ephesians, the third chapter, if you will read from the... Uh, King James and I'll later get into another version he speaks of how in the 7th verse Ephesians chapter 3 he was made a minister of God according to the grace sorry according to the gift of the grace of God given unto him he was made a minister comma according to the gift of of the grace of God given unto him by the effectual working of the power of God. That means the gift of grace operating on our lives qualifies our ministry. And to me, he says, who am less than the least of all saints, is given grace, or this grace, that I should preach among the Gentiles the Bible calls them the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Before I even get into what I'm supposed to be sharing, primarily, our ministry is to make all men see. That when I'm teaching, when I'm preaching, when I'm prophesying, the end of that is to cast the divine vision on the spirit of a man because God cannot emphasize enough the power of sight in whatever is instructed to a man. But the Bible tells us, if you read from the Amplified Version and allow me to engage you there, verses 8 says it this way, to me who am the very least of all saints, God's consecrated people, he says this grace, favor, privilege, was granted and graciously entrusted to proclaim to the Gentiles the unending, listen, boundless, fathomless, incalculable, and exhaustless riches of Christ, that is the wealth, he says, which no human being could have searched out. Let me begin from there. Which no human being could have searched out. Now, in the, in the realm of the spirit, there are things that are for seekers, men which have learned to search out matters. There's a place and provision in the things of the spirit where you can seek or search out something and God will reveal it. But also there are things in God that are not for seekers. They cannot be searched out. These are not for somebody who goes out to say, you know, let me go on a mountain and seek God for this. Even if you seek them, they cannot come. They are not ordained. They are not designed. They are not patterned after a seeking mind. It doesn't mean that God has not called us to seek. I am a seeker like all of us are here. But there are things that are not in the realm of seeking. There are things that are supposed to find you. 
Because you have learned the simple wisdom of positioning yourself. I'll give you a few examples. When you look at a man like Elisha, you remember Elijah has run away from Jezebel and he's saying, oh, all the prophets have been killed, only I am left. And then God tells him, no, I actually have 7,000 men which have not bowed their heads to what? To bow. 7,000, yes. That was not just a word from God. That was a vision, a next level vision to Elijah. Because that in, in whatever Elijah was able to see, he could not see 7,000 prophets. He was a seeker. But he could not see 7,000 hidden men. When he comes out of that cave, God has impressed the next level vision on his spirit. And then he meets a man called who? Elisha. Is it written that God told Elisha to go and wait on a certain road? No. But there was something propelled by divine purpose that aligned Elisha to be positioned at the time when Elijah was looking for the continuation of the ministry of the mantle he carried for Israel. And at that particular point, Marakodi Bazila, one man is positioned somewhere where Elijah should pass and cast the mantle. I say again, certain things cannot be sought. They can only find you positioned. Somebody shout hallelujah. Am I making some sense? If positioning by God was not important, Genesis 48 verses 13 would not have existed in scripture. You remember the time when uh, Joseph uh, brings his children, Ephraim and Manasseh, to Jacob because Jacob is about to depart. And they are going to receive what we call a patriarchal blessing. Because that generation, or those dispensations, ancient wisdom, understands the power of patriarchal blessing. The reason why even when God chose Jacob, he needed the blessing of the father. It was not just enough that from his mother's womb he had been called. He needed God to position him in the place of Esau, by the wisdom upon the mother, to whom God had revealed himself to, and told him that the older shall serve the younger. You remember the story? So this woman, by wisdom, knows that it's not just enough for God to send a prophetic word over that man. The man with the mantle, the the preserving mark of that dispensation, Jacob, uh, yes, uh, Isaac, which was alive, he needed to lay his hand on that boy anyway. So what does God do? Even though the choice was on Esau, God gets Esau out of the picture and positions Jacob because it's important to position somebody in spite of the prophetic utterances on your life, in spite of the knowledge and wisdoms that operate on you. At one point in life, you're going to need God to position you for your next phase of influence, power, affluence, and ministry. So he was positioned. He was positioned. Time comes and he knows, now this man is dying. Let me take my children too. And then he took them, but did not only put them before his father. He positioned them. Now I'm talking about who? Joseph, before Jacob. And the scriptures tell us in verses 13, Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel reached out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger one, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, crossing his hands intentionally. That means Israel knew the positioning. But he also knew where to put his hand. If positioning was not important, there would not have been a mind to put one child on the left and another child on the right. Somebody shout, God position me. me. Some of us who have read church history, at least modern church history, we've read of a story, upon stories upon stories of people God used. And remarkably, there is an, uh, an evangelist they used to call George Jeffries. Him and his brother Stephen were great ministers. They were Welsh men. 
Very, very, very gifted and anointed. Very wise men, teachers of the word. And when you study the life of Judge Jeffries, the anointing on him, especially the evangelistic anointing on him, it was one of the most distinctive anointings of his time. And the stories say it, that in his old age, a young man, Reinhard Bonke, went visiting London. Just visiting. And then while he went visiting, somehow, the story is he bumps into the house of George Jeffries. And they tell him that that house is for a famous revivalist called George Jeffries. And then this young man <laughs> says, oh, I have to meet this fellow. He knocks. George Jeffries lets him for in for a cup of tea. I believe it was about 22 years. And when he lets him in for a cup of tea, he just goes on his knees and prays over this young man and shares some things with him. Impacts his mantle on Reinhard Bonke. The next day, Reinhard Bonke is told that the man who laid hands on you last night died. This is not something Reinhard Bonke would get on a prayer mountain. This is not something Reinhard Bonke would get six, on 60 days of fasting. This is not something Reinhard Bonke would get because he sowed 20 seeds. No, this is something that by God's design and plan, all that hit steps at the right time when a general was about to go to heaven and God was looking for somebody to take that up because there is a continuation in this. And this young man is positioned at that right time. If anybody had turned up before that door, Reinhard Bonke's story might have been different. And you people in Nigeria know this most. Because Reinhard Bonke's most active ministry was about this side of the earth. Positioning. 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 I could tell you story upon story. If you read the stories of Lester Sumero and what happens when he encounters Smith Wigglesworth in the last two years, Smith meets him in a conference and tells him, young man, you need to see me. That was the instruction. You need to see me. When? He said, any time, come to my house. So he walks to his house the next day. The first thing when Lester Sumero walks in, Smith Wigglesworth kneels down on his knees and starts to pray. And praise and praise. He tells him, God has told me to instruct you certain things before I go. After instructing him, the Lord took Smith. Now, if you don't know Lester Sumero, go and study him. You'll be amazed at what God did through that man. Again, this was positioning. I could give example upon example upon example. I have had personal experiences where things came on me only because I was positioned. They didn't even find me fasting and praying. But they found me positioned spiritually. Satan knows this. You might not understand this, but Satan knows this. You remember the story of the book of Numbers? Where Balak, the king of Moab, calls Balaam to come and help him put a curse on the children of Israel. The scriptures tell us in number 22 verses 7. The elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand and they come to Balaam and speak to him the words of Balak, which Balak had said. Now allow me to also touch something there because I'm an apostle. I don't know if some of you have ever studied this thing called the rewards of divination. That's the difference between a prophet and a diviner. That's the only difference. Allow me to say this. No spirit of God demands a pay for a divine oracle. That is not from heaven. But this is an old tradition and a custom of men who used to consult diviners. Men with the spirit of Apollos. If you go back in the book of Acts, there was a girl with the spirit of divination. The Bible says, she brought her master's much gain through her suit saying, much gain. Much gain. Through what? Suit say. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, is that a coincidence that whenever they met a diviner, it was a custom 
that you needed to carry the what? The reward of what? Divination. A reward of divination. That is why when Haman, the Syrian, comes to the prophet, the prophet can't take it. Because he sees that Naaman has come in a corrupted vision responding to the prophet of God. And he says, no, I won't take it because you think you're rewarding me for what money cannot buy. When Gehazi gets that, the Bible says he gets what? Leprous. And guess what? Leprosy, if you study it deeply, leprosy is not just a disease. And the Bible says he came to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, and to cleanse the leper, to raise the dead. Why would he separate the healing of the sick from the cleansing of the leper? Because if you study leprosy deeply, leprosy is not just a physical disease. By God, it's also the spirit of rebellion against divine order. If you remember, the first time a person was leprous in scripture, that was Miriam. The Bible says, her and Aaron are like, no. Doesn't God speak to us also? Hasn't God not commanded us not to marry uh, foreign uh, women? Remember when Moses took on himself a Kushite woman? The scriptures tell us God cast leprosy on who? Miriam. Why? Because she, she was rebelling against divine order. The spirit that frustrates true submission by God. So when we say the cleansing of the leper, we're not just talking about healing the sick. We're trying to also help some people understand the pattern of submission. Understanding divine order. If you've understood it, say amen. amen. Let's continue here. So, when, when, it, when it comes to the reward of divination, I have seen even in present day, I've seen some of our prophets say that if you don't bring these many things, I will not prophesy on your life. We start selling prophecies for $1,000, $2,000, $3,000. If you meet the man of God, he'll give you holy oil. And when you put angels, you understand? I've had it all. And some of you have seen it. You've seen it. No true prophet seeks after that reward. Demands that reward. You can give honor too, but it's not demanded of. Haven't we seen people who have conditioned healing against money to say, you know, if you don't pay this much, I'm not going to pray for you. If you don't pay this much, I'm not going to speak into your destiny. So God is up there in heaven and He has denied a single mother the word for the next space of her destiny because she will not pay the prophet the amount of money he's able to pay. Sorry, I'm an apostle. <laughs> anyway, let's continue. So, Balak, sorry, uh, Balaam follows them. And in verses 13, I want to skip because of time. Balak says unto Balaam when he had come to him, I pray thee with me unto another place from whence thou... No, 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 sorry. I think, I think I'm skipping something. Yes, verse 13. And Balak said unto him, Come, I pray unto thee with me unto another place, from whence thou may see them. Thou shalt see but the uttermost part of them, and shalt not see them all, and cast them for me. He brought him to the field of Zophim, to the top of Pisgah, and built seven altars, and offered a bullock and a ram of every altar, and tells him, See Israel from this direction, this perspective, and see whether you can find any fault with them to cast them for me. But you see, Balak did not invite Balaam into his courts and told him, cast from Israel. He took him to a place. He positioned him somewhere from where he was able to behold Israel to be able to cast them. And then God said, no, regardless of from where you're positioned, I shall not cast whom I have blessed. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. He goes to 27 and Balak said unto Balaam, Come, I pray thee, I will bring thee unto another place. But adventure, it will please God that you may cast them from me from there. Balak got this guy from Bisgan and then took him to the top of Peor to look upon toward, toward what? The place is Jeshimon. And tells him, look from here and tell me. Can't you cast them from here? Balak looks and he still cannot find any fault with Israel. He says, I cannot cast whom the Lord has blessed. You go step upon step upon step upon step and you see him moving him places because he hopes that there is a place where Balaam will see 
a certain space where he can cast Israel and he can't. This is Satan saying, I understand the power of positioning. This is the devil saying, I understand the power of positioning. I can't just bring him to cast them. I need to look for a, from, from, from a vantage point. I need to position the eye of the prophet in a place where he can see things I know. In fact, in the earlier verses, I think it took him at a certain, at a bal altar or something like that. If you read the scriptures, it took him in three places. And he still pointed somewhere. And the man could not still cast them. That is why the problem God has with Balaam, the fact that in all his positionings, God gives him the same vision in Israel. He found another way of manipulating the system to place a curse on Israel. And you find it in the book of Revelations. The Bible tells us, uh, chapter 2, verses 12, to the angel of the church in Pagamos, he tells him, uh, this thing says he which has the sharp sword with two edges, I know thy works whereof you dwell, even where certain cities, and you hold fast my name and has not denied my faith, even in those days where in Antipas and my faith uh, was my faithful matter, who was slain among you uh, where certain dwellers. But I have a few things against thee, verses 14, because you, the Bible says, has, has there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat the things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. This is what he did. Because by positioning he could not cast Israel, he calls Balak and tells him, but there is a way you can put a curse on them. I am going to teach you by doctrine how to Teach the children of Israel to eat things offered unto idols. How to teach them to fornicate. How to teach them to do every kind of thing such that they can rebel against their God. And therewith the curse will come upon him. But if you're just going to look at them from, from the positioning, you can't cast them. That's the problem God has with Balak. That the prophetic word became a doctrine in the book of Revelation. In the latter church. Am I going somewhere? You see, some of you must understand how things work. For example, if you study the New Testament, you're going to find only two places where the curse is. Two. The first place in the New Testament, he says, cast is he which is under the law. There's a curse on somebody who stays under the law. And then the second time, Paul pronounces a curse, is anybody who preaches any other gospel other than this. Those are the only two places the curse is found in the New Testament. Do you know what that means? Do you know what it means to get a, a teaching of a generational curse and bringing it into the New Testament where a man is a new creature and behold, all things are past. And now all things have become new. And all things, the Bible says, are of God, which has reconciled us unto himself. And he has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. That's our ministry. That's our ministry. This is what I'm trying to say. Even Jeremiah prophesied it. He said, it shall not be hard that the children have eaten of sour grapes. And the fathers have eaten of sour grapes and their children's teeth are set on the edge. The soul that sins shall die. If a son lives right and a father lives wrong, I shall not send that curse on the son. But how many people up to today still tell new creation that you're still fighting your great, 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 by fire, by force, mountain up, down, cut, kill, destroy. And some of you have cast these things for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Nothing is changing. You're just growing older, but nothing is changing. Every day you're breaking something off your life. Yet there are people who have understood that greater is he who is in them than he that is in the world. There are people who have understood that they're more than conquerors by Christ which strengthens them. There are people who have understood that they've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. There are people who have understood that they've been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. They understand that. The Bible says that the devil came to kill, steal, and destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, the Bible says, until it overflows. 
the doctrine of Balaam is back. We are cursing whom God blessed. I said we are cursing whom God blessed. Let me tell you. You are under no curse. Biblically. Theologically you might. But not biblically. That's why we need to transition beyond theology to theophany. The experience, time and chance. Every man must have an appointed time to know God for himself. So that when I stand on the pulpit, I'm simply affirming what is already defined in your spirit and understanding. How long are we going to rebuke devils? Every time you're rebuking, every time you're rebuking, every time you're rebuking, every time you're rebuking. A woman came to me and says, oh, this demon of my family, oh, 13 years apostle, I've never conceived. Oh, 13, I said, when do you want to have children? She told me immediately. I told her, next year I'll carry your child. That was the prayer. No, it was not father. No, he said, you shall decree a thing. And it shall be established. If you say I'm not under a curse, you are not under a curse. If they were to collect all the demons in the world and put them together, all of the demons in the world, the God in you would still be greater. That's why he says greater is he. So then how can you be possessed? Then somebody says, oh, he doesn't believe in deliverance. No, watch my videos and see. Or try me if you came with a tenant today, I'll show you. <laughs> Free of charge. No sugar added. Once I speak, it will come out. No, no, we are anointed for that. But we only cast out of people who we know have not yet come to the understanding. Who wills that all men be saved, comma, and that they might come to the knowledge of the truth. Peter elucidates that truth. And he calls it present truth. He says, wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance, even though you know and are established in the present truth. What is the word present there? The Greek word present is the truth above. That means, even though we have truths, some truths are above other truths. That's why you're not circumcising boys now. As a custom in the Bible. But the circumcision of the heart is above the circumcision of the flesh. Yeah. So if somebody lives in a lower truth, it doesn't mean they are wrong. It only means they are not going to live a glorious life like some of us. There are people who need 20 days to fast for sickness. There are people who just wake up and look at it and it runs. (laughs) (laughs) Somebody shout amen! Amen! And make me a false teacher. It only means I've chosen to live above. The Bible says you're seated with Christ far above all principalities and powers. So how do they even equate to frustrate you? Yet the Bible says you need to go down to find them. So by the time they teach you to, to a place where a devil is on the level of killing you, that's the doctrine of Balaam. Praise the Lord Jesus. By the time they can tell you to strangle you, by the time somebody can tell you that you know you can die. <laughs> you know that the devil can kill you on the road there. No, 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 no. The ones they're talking about didn't come in this conference. The devil can't just kill you. Come on, come on, elbow somebody and tell them I just can't die. No! I just can't be bewitched. No, you send all the witchcraft you want. One time a very famous person in my village put witchcraft on, 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 on our gate. And then he put a, a dead cork, cork, cork and cut it and put things in there. Then I opened the gate and the cork was there. You know what I did? I first checked to see whether it's alive. Because if it was alive... Unfortunately, it was dead. So I just did like this. 
I skipped it. And I went. Why? Because I'm trying to taunt the devil. To tell him I'm not here. Some of you, they ask you, did you skip something? Yeah, your leg is swollen. <laughs> I skipped something. Oh. And then they start praying. And then you're casting and breaking. And I'm thinking, but there are people who eat things every day. He says, you shall take poison. But none of these things shall by any means harm you. Balaam was teaching. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. But back to what I was trying to say. So we see in Numbers 23, we see the prophet being positioned. The king of Moab wants him to curse Israel. And if you'll allow me to engage you a bit, who are the Moabites? Some of you know the story. When Lot runs away from Sodom and Gomorrah, he comes with his children. You remember the story? And then two of his daughters lost their sons. And then the two say, let's get this man drunk and then have children out of that. And the elder one had Moab. The younger sister had Ammon. Which out of that is the Moabites and the Ammonites? Now you understand that. These are Abraham's nephews. Lot is Abraham's nephew, right? So these are Abraham's relatives. But at one particular point, the Moabites and the Ammonites betrayed the submission of Lot to Abraham and later chose their own way after pagan gods. And eventually, the blessing that was seen on the seed of Abraham, the Moabites and the Ammonites started to envy, became jealous and started fighting with Israel. And that's how they become what? Enemies. This is important for you to get because I'm going to teach something so deep here. Now, when this king, Balak, which is a Moab, has failed to curse the children of Israel. Even though it ended there, it does not mean that Satan ended that day. The spirit of Moab was still seeking a certain opportunity to connect, to somehow find a way of defiling and destroying Israel. Numbers 23, go to 24, go to 25. When you enter 27... You find that when God had judged Moses for hitting the rock which he was supposed to speak to. Those of you who read your Bible. The scriptures tell us God appears to him in Numbers 27 and tells him, verses 12. The Lord said to Moses, get thee up into the Mount Abirim. Abirim. Now let me explain Abirim. Abirim, the Hebrew word there, Abirim means a range of mountains. When you study the range of mountains, Nebo was among the range of mountains. Are you following? Somebody said positioning. Now, he tells him, and see the land which I have given unto thee and the children of Israel, and when you have seen it, you shall be gathered unto thy people as Aaron thy brother was gathered, for ye rebelled against my commandment in the desert of Zin, in the strife of the congregation, to sanctify me at the water before their eyes. That is the water of Meribah in Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin. So he's telling him, this thing you're going to see, you're going to see the promised land, but you're not going to see it to enter. You're going to see it from afar. And I'm going to tell you on, I'm going to take you on, a mountain barim, which is Nebo. Now, Nebo in the Bible is a high, high mountain in Moab. Nebo was in Moab. Follow me. It's part of Moab. So Moses goes on that mountain, sees the promised land, and dies there. This is the leader of Israel. He has died there in Moab. The spirit at work in Moab is thinking, what has killed their leader? What has killed their leader? Satan goes up that mountain 
and finds the body. And he starts to fight for it. Now some of you have ever asked yourself, why would Satan fight for the body of Moses? Why? Fundamentally, this is what the Lord showed me. That he wanted this body because for some reason he needed any point of contact either that would testify of the death of the leader of Israel or connect to the vision of what he last saw to kill him on that mountain because in the end he thought he could find a way of destroying Israel through what destroyed their leader. But there's a reason why it's on Moab. It's not on any other mountain because Satan continued his way. Positioning. Every time Moab rebels against Israel, you see more destruction with them. Because like you saw Abraham and Lot, Lot was never God's choice. He entered this thing only because he positioned himself when God had spoken to Abraham. How many of you understand it? He was never part of this portion. He was only positioned in the time when he had this man speak. And he says, let's go. Everything Lot has is because one man had seen God. One man had seen God. Now, the scriptures tell us they go together. And the Bible says, when Abraham got cattle, Lot got cattle. Positioning. No relationship, no covenant. When Abraham got sheep, Lot got sheep. When Abraham built himself tents, Lot got tents. Until a time where the land could not hold him. And Abraham tells Lot, you know what? You choose anywhere you will go. We cannot continue fighting with this substance and our hard men against your hard men. This whole land is before us. Separate yourself a place. Go to the left, I'll go to the right. Go to the right, then I'll go to the left. And the Bible tells us, Lord chose the fertile plains of Sodom. He says, I'll go here. And the Bible tells us, the moment, Genesis 13 verses 14, allow me to take you back. And the Lord said unto Abraham, after Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest, thee I will give it unto thy seed forever. The Hebrew says, for the land which thou seest, I have given. He didn't say I will give, because the Hebrew didn't speak in future tense. You understand what I'm saying? I have given. If you study Hebrew. But that's not where I want to go today. Listen to this. God gets a man from his father and mother. And tells him, go leave your kin, your kith, your family and go to a place that I will show you. Are you following? Abraham gets his family with Lot and the rest. And he goes to Canaan. And Abraham all along thinks Canaan is an inheritance. Until the day he separates from Lot. He discovers Canaan was not an inheritance. Canaan was a position. How do I know? He tells him, look from whence. Look from there. That's not an inheritance. That's a position. Look from there. Canaan was not Abraham's destination. Look from there. It was a pattern of defining destiny. He tells him, look from there. For as far as your eyes have seen, that is what I've given you. Not where I took you to see. Who has understood what I just said? It's not Canaan where I took you to see. That's not your inheritance. In fact, if you want to define your inheritance, then it should be true sight. Vision. Not this land. Abraham closes his eyes. And he walks the world. He walks the whole world. Three chapters later, the name is changed to the father of all. Why? Because the first place of obedience was going where he knew not. And when he reaches where he knew not, God positions him. He says, look from whence? Northward, southward, eastward, westward. For as far as your eyes have seen, that I have given you. He could have walked a few kilometers, but in the spirit, this man walked the whole world. That voice would not find him with his father terror. It had to find him in Canaan. 
Some of you, what you call your destinations are actually places of positioning. God has not even yet started with you. <laughs> Some of you pastors think you've started a church. No, 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 no. No, it's, you're, just, you're just being positioned to start. When your eyes open one day, you will realize that God has called you for way bigger, but he had to invite you to a place where you could see. This was just a pattern. It wasn't in his inheritance. Nigeria is not your inheritance. Some of you, some of you it is, but some of you, it's from where you look. <laughs> Who has understood what I just said? Some of us, Uganda is not our destination. It's a vantage point from where which we preach the gospel. I walked to 50 young men in a small room and I told them we are going to preach to the whole world. We didn't have cameras, we didn't have chairs, we didn't have pianos, we didn't have lights, we didn't have anybody. Nobody knew me. Nobody knew us. Some of us, we, 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 we drank from dead, uh, for, from, from, we fell on, on, on bones of the dead. You sit on Kenneth e. Hagin and consume the guy from morning to evening. Because some men are sources, they're not resources. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, I tell these guys, we're going to preach the gospel to the whole world. They don't ask how. They just start screaming. The chairs which we were using in that room were borrowed. The room in which we were was borrowed. Nothing was in my name. And I told them we are going on TBN International. And they start screaming. Five years later, TBN calls me and says, we want you on set at any cost. God TV called me and they said, we want you on, te- on set at any cost. Face TV called me UK, we want you on set. First January, we are on desktop. Because Uganda is not my destination. I'm positioned there to see. Come on somebody. Lagos is not your destination. You're just positioned here to see. And as far as your eyes can see, not he will give you. He has given you. <laughs> Tap somebody and ask them, what do you see? While there were still 50, I told them we are the biggest church in Uganda. We were still 50. In five years from the day Fenero was bust, we had the biggest meeting in our country. Five years on. Five years on. Well, because some of you, the, the problem is you see wrong. You, you see indifferently. You, you, you don't see. You, every time you're sleeping, you see things strangling you. Cows are chasing you. They're firing you. You're being chucked. Your husband is leaving. Your kids are... Somebody, Wafbeck is a positioning. You're not here to be encouraged. No, you're not here to be strengthened. You are here because God positioned you today, this week, this season, at the 10th anniversary, because there was something you were going to connect to that is older than you, richer than you, bigger than you, more established than you are, distinctive than you are. There is somebody listening to me in this room. Today, the womb, the midwife that has come to be got you to your next level of ministry is in this room this morning. God is going to take you to the next level of ministry. I hear somebody. Nations are calling you from here. Continents are calling you from here. Television stations are calling you from here. Radio stations are looking for your voice from... Come on, clap for Jesus. Some things you can't buy, you can only position. You had a choice to stay home because it was a Saturday morning. I had a choice to travel. Pastor Pojo had a choice to put this conference or not. But we're all working under that law. It is demystifying things and aligning. It is positioning us. God sent me to somebody. Something is stirring up in your spirit. And in about a few days, your nation, beyond your nation, God has given you a language. 
and it's about to come out. No, no, forget your dis- your degree. Forget your university theology. For- forget, no, no, not that theology is bad. I'm only trying to tell you. Forget your qualifications. Forget your, your PhD in, 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 in mathematics and, 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 and physics. No, God wants to put something on you. Like Paul says, no man could find. Some things are unsearchable. Some things are unsearchable. In fact, as we're praying, ask for something no man can find. Something a seeker cannot find, but can find you. Abraham was not seeking God when he consecrated him. He was worshipping the sun and God appeared. Paul was not seeking God when he appeared unto him on his way to Damascus. He was going to persecute the church and God met him. Some of us, we were not seeking him. He sought us. I don't know who I'm talking to. Some of us, we were not found in the church praying. And then he consecrated us. No. He found us in our own way. And says, I've chosen you. For a work bigger than you are. And I'm going to give you something. That cannot be found in a book. That cannot be found in a CD. That cannot be found on a tape. That cannot be read in... I don't know who I'm talking to. That is why understanding patterns is a very important thing. The Bible says that we can only strive lawfully. There are laws that govern mastery. The Bible says if any man desires mastery, he must be temperate in all things. The Greek word there for temperate is patterned. I'm showing you a pattern here. Certain things can position you. Let me show you something. How many of you remember Elimelech? You remember the man called Elimelech? He marries his wife Naomi. And then famine hits Bethlehem Judah. Wow. The coincidence. Bethlehem means house of bread. And the house of bread lacked food. And the famine hit. And then Elimelech and his family moved to Moab. Where their sons, Chilion and Malon, meet two Moabite women. One was Opa, another one was Ruth. And then, the sons die. If you remember the story. Naomi sends them back. Ruth refuses. The Hebrew word Ruth means, or name Ruth means, friendship. So God was trying to build a reconciliation between the Moabite and the Jew. Because he wanted the seed of Lot To be part of an inheritance. Because he remembered that Lot once served Abraham. Some of you, there are things. Some of you, there are things you're doing now. That might not work for you. But in generations to come, if Christ is back. God will position your children in certain places. To reconcile them to the God you're serving now. Because that's how God works. He remembered the relationship Lot had with Abraham. And he went back to create friendship through Ruth. And when Ruth allowed, he got that Moabite woman, brought her to Boaz to be a grandmother of the great man, Jesus. But in Ruth refusing to go back to Moab and choosing to stay with Naomi, that was positioning. Some of you, our generation is so easily offended. Yeah. Pastor Podjo just needs to say something wrong and you're going to leave the church next day because there are many churches in Nigeria. That's how you think. And that's why some of you, your, your problem is not generational curses. Your problem is you're not aligned. The Bible says when the spirit of the ruler rises against thee, the Bible says do not leave your place for yielding pacifieth great offense. If Naomi had insulted Ruth and Ruth left, that was the end of the Moabite destiny. 
But Ruth had to understand that whether it's rain or sunshine, whether you flip me or kill me, whether you roll me or, or mess me up, I'm not going to leave you because I'm not here because I want the next day of meal. I am here because I'm preserving a posterity. I want to save a generation. I'm bringing a reconciliation. As of whether Ruth understand what, understood what was happening or not. That's not the point. The point is, that there was a positioning. So when we talk about being planted in the house of the Lord. Shall flourish in his courts. He's not talking about people who go hoping church to church. YouTube on YouTube. Facebook on Facebook. He's talking of people who have understood the power of positioning. Psalms 92 verses 13. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord. Shall flourish in the courts of their God. To that man there are no seasons. He commands the seasons. You know some of you, uh, don't worry, I'm with you in the evening. But some of you must understand how seasons work. There are people who are waiting for a season to enter. And there are people who have learned the mystery of commanding seasons. That is why to be led by the Holy Spirit is a very fundamental thing. Because nothing defines us like being led. These things we call submission and accountability in the church today. That's positioning. There are many Christians who cannot submit under one anointing. Everybody is their pastor. Study them. They're not progressing. The message positions us. They cannot tell you that greater is he which is in you than he which is in the world. And tomorrow you're in a conference casting out generation. Curses. But yesterday your pastor was telling you that you're more than a conqueror. The next day you're in another conference casting out generational curses. And then the next day you're in victorious conference where they're teaching about the victory in Christ. And then the next day you're in death must die. <laughs> so, you're already conflicted in your spirit. You're double-minded. That's your problem. Your problem is not all oh, poverty, my brother. No, your problem is that thing. You're conflicted in your spirit. You're not planted. You're not positioned. Submission positions us. Patterns position us. The message positions us. The leading of the spirit, the understanding how the spirit of God speaks positions us. Now, this is what I want to speak as I close. Six minutes to go. In the last days in which we're living, I started to see a multiplication of gifts, assignments, and mandate. And in a vision, the Lord himself told me, I'm looking more for men who have positioned themselves than men who only understand to seek me. Because there are many which seek me, cannot find me, because they don't understand how to seek me. And certain things precede others. True positioning qualifies you to be the right seeker. Because if you seek without the right positioning, chances are you will seek a God you will never test. You will never experience. Let me tell you, I know people in the world who pray. There are people in the world who pray. And I'm not saying I don't pray. No, I pray. Every night. I sleep less because of prayer. But I know people who pray, but there is no fruit of their prayer. Because they are seeking where they are not positioned. And I came to help somebody. Ask God to help you digest this and understand it. Because when you do, you'll always find yourself in the right place. At the right time. The Bible says that the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. You'll stumble on your lot so easily. There will be no struggle or strife in whatever must find you. In fact, more things will find you than you will seek them. 
they will find you more than you seek them. There are people right now somewhere to whom God is going to find. And he told Israel, you'll seek me, but you shall not find me. (laughs) You will seek me, but you shall not find me. Why? Because they were positioned under a wrong foundation. Come on, let's take a few minutes and talk to God. Tell God, position me. That's a few minutes. Speak in tongues. Speak in tongues. Speak in tongues. You take me. You mold me. You use me. Feel me. Cause I can. My life to the poor's head. You call me, you guide me, me up beside cause I can't. Position as God. Position as God. Position as God. Position as God. 